I raised a very nice little boy. To the age of 19. He left me when he graduated from high school, 1965, into the Marine Corps. He was 19 years old. I had a good life with him. I met Freddie working in the fields picking cotton, and I was impressed with him from the get-go because he was such a hard worker. We were just little kids. The rows are very long when you pick cotton. You pick one row of cotton, and you go 100 yards, whatever. Well, Freddie would pick two rows at a time and we'll be one row at a time. So by the time we get to our end of that row of cotton, he already had finished two and is starting this third and fourth one. We knew right off the bat that Freddie was a little different than most kids. He was a lot tougher than we were. I used to play football in Monte Alto. It's a small community from, from Edinburgh. So I played football with Freddie and so we became friends, good friends after that. Freddie was with uh, kind of the good guys, you know, from school. And I used to be getting involved with uh, the bad guys. In school, we were good friends, you know. We would go out and eat together at the cafeteria and everything. He was probably the smallest lineman, offensive lineman in, in the football team, but he probably was the toughest. He'd make sure that every time he was block somebody, the opponent, he'd gonna make sure he was gonna beat that guy, and he did. He was about eight years old when he started watching, you know when TV came out? John Wayne. He was well, not actually a Marine in, in real life, but he played the Marine, and that made him turn into me in the Marine. Freddie left right after high school, joined the Marines. He was a true patriot. You didn't find too many guys like that guy. He didn't even have to join the Marine Corps. He didn't have to. Back in those days, if I remember right, if you were a one-child boy in a family, you were exempt. But Freddie was different. He wanted to go really bad. He wanted to fight for his country. I think Freddie left in, in uh, June, right after high school. He wrote every day, I think every day. I mean, I had a neighbor that would keep me in touch, and she said, she's got letters. I was looking at school. So I would run home from work just to read his letters. Freddie would be very distinct in his, and very detailed in his letters. Freddie told me they would go out at night patrol in the DMZ to hunt for Viet Cong, and they were laying just in the ground by plants and in the jungle. And he actually told me he felt a snake crawl over his back feet, but you couldn't move. You had to be very still. You could not do anything. He wrote, by my count, about 500 letters back home. He wrote to so many people, and he mentions them. And then he was heartbroken every time that a day went by when he didn't get a letter. And he would push people back home. Mom, why aren't you writing? Artie, why aren't you writing? Hey, tell this person or that person to write. I'm not getting letters. Mom, can you send more paper? I'm out of paper. Mom, can you send me uh, stamps? The humanity of this guy was palpable as you read his letters. He loved his, his brothers who were Marines, and he saved a bunch of them. And he loved his mother. Mom, how are you? I hope you're not working too hard. Birthday cards, Mother's Day cards. Oh, I loved my boy when he was coming home from Vietnam. One of my nephews, they were all little, and he came and told me there's a police out there. A police, so I ran to the door. So I went out there and there he was. He came back, and, and thank God he came back all in one piece. And Freddie told us that was it for him. He wasn't going back. He was not going back. And three, four months later, and he was on his way back. Freddie, what the heck happened? He said, I got to go back and take care of my buddies. His heart was broken when he knew that a lot of his friends were getting killed in Vietnam. I do remember when we took him to the bus station. Like, if it was today, you know, you can't forget those things, you know. He didn't have a vehicle, so I borrowed my dad's car and brought him to the bus station. And we were there to say hello, goodbye, you know, so that was the last time I, I saw him. During Tet, which is the Vietnamese New Year, there was an agreement between the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese and the American forces in the South Vietnamese that there would be a ceasefire. And so that diplomatic agreement, gentlemanly agreement, if you will, was violated in 1968 by the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese because they found that the public opinion globally, public opinion especially in the States, had turned against the American forces. Freddie just happens to be right in the middle of his second tour. Freddie had just been given the sergeant position with his platoon because there had been leadership changes. At the time, we knew that this was his second tour, and you 
you really respected a person for the survival of the first tour and then come back and want to train everybody. I mean, th that, that shows commitment. He was tough. He was a tough guy, but he was fair. And he was good with the Marines and kept them in the, under control. You have men that are there that don't have a clue what they're doing. And it was pretty clear that he knew what he was doing. He'd been there before, been around the block. In January, Freddie was stationed in Kantian on the north side of Vietnam, very close to the demilitarized zone, which separated North Vietnam from South Vietnam. His platoon then began to move down a little bit. It appears that Way is a place of great contention. As we were going into Way City, if it can be described in one word, it was chaos. And it was chaos from the higher echelons all the way down. We got on trucks and we headed south. We turned around an hour, a couple hours later, turned around, we headed north. And it's like, oh, what are we doing? Does anybody know what's going on? We were first riding tanks. The tank drivers were not interested in our comfort and riding on the tanks. And it became very easy to be thrown off or get off the tank. So then we were walking behind them. Brady had previously, in the days before, had actually done the heroic act of taking out a machine gun bunker to allow his platoon to continue into Way and been injured himself February the 4th when Way City then began in earnest as a battle. And they go to the ancient part of Way City, the old town, the historic town, where right in the middle of it is the St. Joan of Arc School. The Joan of Arc School is built in a square. And in the middle was an opening, like a courtyard. And some of the buildings in this square had two stories, some were just one story. To get to that square building, you had to go through a small administrative building, and then exit out into an open area, and then get into the square. They actually went in through one, one kind of corridor that they had to go through to get to the plaza type of area in the center. And so when they made it in, they tried to then control one fourth of the square. And it was Freddie's role as the platoon leader at that time to get us in and, and get us situated where we could start making the attack in force. Unfortunately, the North Vietnamese held three corners of the square and we were attempting to get into one part of it and that's how we started. So they made it in and it was, of course, you know, all hell breaking loose. And so Freddie's, you know, uh, Marines, they went into different parts of the structure and Freddie was right in the center of it, calling the shots, literally in harm's way. I wound up being in a stairwell, a second floor stairwell, firing from a window. Down below, Sergeant Gonzalez was running back and forth, getting people in position, firing rockets, you know, trying to suppress the fire coming at us from the opposite side of the square. He led from the front. He didn't say, go get them. He said, follow me. The assault began on the 4th of February, that's the day Freddie was killed, and we didn't pull out of there until the 6th of February. There's a saying that Vietnam vets have, strangers once, brothers forever. And I think Marines like Freddie were able to instill that kind of bond with everybody else. There are a lot of good men that died, but it doesn't surprise me that he made the extra effort to try and save people, that he exposed himself. That's why sergeants are God. They're not afraid to do what has to be done. In his letters, there's so much evidence of a sense of hope. Freddie was quintessentially aspirational, but did the work of a sergeant, which meant that he led. And as he led, he just happened to take fire that would kill him that fateful day on February the 4th, 1968. And it is the commencement of this, this unbelievable narrative of a man, of a Marine, of a hero, you know, of a small town guy who would then become a symbol 
of courage, symbol of patriotism. I was working in a place in a, and they called me that I had to be home. I said, I can't, I have to work tomorrow. And somehow I got the day off. They came to the house, they walked in and we talked and she told me about the Medal of Honor. Dolia called us and let us know that he was gonna be getting the Medal of Honor. So the city was all very involved because they were proud that from such a small city here in this country we live in, that he would be honored in that manner. There was three of us that went to Washington in 1969, and I was just by my little self. I had two people beside me, and I said, I'm not gonna cry. But when I saw him crying, I, I cried. <laughs> after I got the Medal of Honor and everything, the post was named after him. The phone rang and I went and answered it. Office of Keepers of my Gossa was calling me to tell me they were gonna be on a ship. I hung up and I was, and my sister said, what, what, what was it? They're going to name a ship after Philly. But it's a humongous thing. When I broke the bottle, I had to say, I named the USS Gonzalez. And I crashed the bottle, and I, I still wanted to fit it again. I had, I had wine all over. I'm very proud of him and his mom. The whole city got involved doing things for Freddie, about the school, the street. There's a little park also. 50 years since Freddie had passed, we got to meet a lot of these Marines. They had a lot to say about Freddie. They were so proud of him. They could not say enough about him. They felt he was a strong leader. Well, it's pretty obvious, especially in this town, Edinburgh, that everyone knows of Alfredo Gonzalez. Personally, I'm proud to have known him and been part of that unit. I mentioned to his mother, Dolia, that when I had a tour of the ship, the USS Gonzalez, there was a, a bust on the bridge of the ship with a cans over it and said, shush, Freddy sleeps. And I asked, who's Freddy? And they looked at me like I was nuts. And they said, well, that's Freddy Gonzalez. And I said, well, what did you call him? And I said, <laughs> said he was the Marine Sergeant. You called him Sergeant? Or said, if you're on the top of the tier of his list, you got to call him G. If you're a little further down, it was Sergeant G. If you're on the bottom, it was Sergeant Gonzalez. Luckily, I was able to call him G. Freddie was a true hero. He gave up his life to save his Marines. I would really appreciate if our Americans who have no exposure to military services appreciate and at least respect those who did go because some of us were lucky that they came back, but a lot of them did not come back. And because of them, we have the freedom that we have, and we need to protect that. I want people to know Freddy as a hero from Edinburgh, Texas, and the Rio Grande Valley. He believed in military, protecting America, and his fellow Marines. Freddy Gonzalez is really the, the life of so many others and the heroism of so many others, this one character personifies love for country, love for family, love for hometown. My culture, the Mexican-American culture, we believe in our country and we fight for our country. Freddie was a true American hero and he was that way before he even joined the Marine Corps. And what was in his heart, he saw in the, on the battlefield. To a little Mexican being, I want to call my boy. To have all these honors, I make me very proud. I'm happy with my life. What I did, I raised a good boy. I'm proud of him until the day I die.